Okay, good morning. Oh. Good, good morning. Oh, hi. Good. Uh, some people are still going to be over there uh, getting pies for Thanksgiving. If you want a pie made for you for Thanksgiving, the table's right over there with the Barrett's, and they're selling pies. I don't know. A P and then a long I. Yeah. We're going to start a Reformation study. It's going to run four weeks. We're starting it today, as you can see um, on the projector here. You're welcome to be a part of it. This so I can see my next slide coming. Okay. Uh, does someone want to assist me in passing out these packets? Free, please. Uh, any extras just put back up here on the table, and next week uh, we've got folks who need some. We'll, uh, we'll go from there. So grab a cup of coffee, grab a donut, grab a sample of pie, then grab a seat and grab a packet, and then we're going to get rolling. Those of you uh, tuning in from home, uh, just letting you know, I'm, I'm sorry I can't hand you the same documents in person. We're going to, you'll hear what we're talking about. We're going to be looking at uh, documents that concern the uh, practice of the Lord's Supper. And I'll explain to y'all at home and to those here live uh, what the, uh, like, why would we be going over some of those documents concerning the Lord's Supper? Uh, in, reference to the Lutheran Reformation. So we'll talk about that next time. Yeah, so uh, if I could get if I could get us rolling, I'm not sure that I can. It is definitely a Reformation Sunday. It's definitely Halloween and everybody's high on sugar. And uh, shut it off. Y'all come in, grab a seat, and we're going to get rolling with the uh, Reformation Bible study. This is, um, I, well, I say Bible study. We will be looking at scriptures as we go, but it's uh, kind of a historical study too, right? So, Okay, so welcome. We're going to do a short four-week series on the Reformation. And so you see that on the slides uh, in front of you. You should have received a packet of uh, short little readings regarding the Lord's Supper. So if I could have uh, your attention not on the packet, although this is the problem with handing out a packet, then you all want to read the packet. Um, if I could have your attention up front, let's just go over some of this together. First of all, what are these documents? Okay. Uh, these documents are compiled from a year-long Bible study that uh, our district president, Rich Snow, did with pastors all over the Nebraska district. And so for a year, the pastors of the entire Nebraska district, so from east to west, uh, President Snow would mark times to meet with different groups of us, and for a year straight, we were involved in a Bible study that had to do with the Lord's Supper. So these documents are the, the kind of compiled thoughts of all the pastors of the district. Now, why did, why did uh, Rich Snow want the thoughts of all the pastors of the district? Well, because uh, we've got pastors in the district who have uh, kind of specialties, like that's the, kind of more their thing. Like some guys are more like historians and some guys are more exegetes. They, they're really good with their Greek and Hebrew and 
some guys are good with something like missiology, like a practical kind of concern uh, coming from practical theology. And so he, he compiled uh, the, the notes from the study of the Lord's Supper from like a whole year of doing this. So that's what these documents are that you've got. And they're not super technical. They're, they're pretty straightforward um, because the idea of the study wasn't to try to write a paper for an academic journal or something. The, the point of the study was to talk about how we're practicing the Lord's Supper in our congregations in the Nebraska district, okay? And so it's really straightforward stuff. So that's also where the documents come from. So they're all about the Lord's Supper. That's where they come from, a year-long study. So here's a question. Why are we reading these along with the study of the Reformation? Well, because part of the study has to do with how were they practicing the Lord's Supper 500 years ago at the start of the Reformation? And from 500 years ago to now, what changed and why did it change? I'm just realizing I've still got my top button button from where I was wearing my robe, but I'm not wearing a top. Oh, that's better. <laughs> like being choked by a little person. Anyway, um, <laughs> so uh, so what the reason we're reading these now along with the Reformation is because a lot of these documents, as you read through them at home, will have something to do with how we got from how we were practicing the Lord's Supper 500 years ago to how we're practicing it in America today. What changed? Why did it change? Okay. Um, so let's just take the first one real quick, just for the first study. And then we'll get to the, the actual Reformation slides that I've prepared for us. So if you look at the first one, number one, the witness of scripture, the Lutheran Church has traditionally left the discussion of how often to celebrate or offer the sacrament of the Lord's Supper as an open question. While the celebration of the sacrament is mandated in Scripture, the frequency is not commanded. Lutheran Christians should not make a law or rule where God has not. Every Lutheran Christian congregation has to make a determination about what is the best practice for the care of the souls in that setting. Practices in worship should be guided by God's word and love for God and for fellow believers we walk in unity. In the Gospels, Jesus does not tell his disciples how often they should celebrate the sacrament. However, in the New Testament, there is no mention of Sunday services without a mention of the Lord's Supper. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, Paul describes the earliest services, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' teaching, in the fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayer. So the breaking of bread, or communion, was a common part of the normal Christian services. These services were held in the evening or early morning since most people worked on Sundays. It was not until the year 321 AD that Sunday became a day of rest for Christians. Another reference to Sunday services is found in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, where Luke says, on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Then it describes a service with preaching followed by the breaking of bread. You get the impression from these verses that Sunday worship was reserved for both instruction and doctrine and celebrating the sacrament of Holy Communion. First Corinthians shows the same thing. In chapter 11, the people came together as a church. Part of the coming together was to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Here, the people would include in this gathering a meal called the Love Feast. This feast is also mentioned in Jude 12. In uh, Corinth, the rich people would exclude some of the poor people from the Love Feast and instead would gorge and get drunk. Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not, Paul said in 1 Corinthians. The people had gathered for the Lord's Supper, but were abusing it. Paul criticizes them for their abuse and corrects it by explaining how their services should be done. Listen to his words. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and to some extent I believe it. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For I receive from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, etc. And you all hear me say that every week. Uh, as we celebrate. So Paul corrected the bad and kept the good. To Paul, the exclusion of poor people who were part of the church was bad. To Paul, communion at every service was good. While this is not a command, it certainly shows how the apostles in the early church practiced the frequency of celebrating the sacrament and Lord's Supper every week when they gathered for worship. And then that's it, okay? And there's like seven of these. And I gave them to you as a packet so that you can take them home and read them for yourself. As we come together, I'll give just a few minutes at the beginning of each one of these Reformation studies for a short discussion on the Lord's Supper, where we were, where we are, how we got here, and we can just kind of keep that as part of our discussion 
of reformation past and ongoing effects. Okay. Everybody cool with that? Good. So pretty short stuff. We're talking about though today, the reformation and I've got a bunch of guys up there for you. Not just Marty Luther in the center there. There's a bunch of guys in funky hats. Uh, many of them were scholars, hence the funny hats. So there's two reformations to talk about, not one. <coughs> if you talk about the Protestant Reformation, and again, that's why I've got all the guys up there. So Marty Luther is in the center, and then you've got different other folks from other countries uh, who are also up there as part of the Reformation. You've got John Calvin and William Tyndale and others. Um, the Protestant Reformation has to do with a time period that is generally can be dated from 1517 to 1559. And that's the Protestant Reformation in the largest sense of what happened in Germany with Marty Luther and the gang. And then it spread to other countries. And it was spearheaded in other countries by different leaders. Okay. So um, that's the Protestant Reformation. That's all Protestants. English Protestants, Dutch Protestants, German Protestants, French Protestants. Okay. All protesting abuses that had become common in the church. Today, we call it the Roman Catholic Church. Back in the day, you would have just called it the church because there was only one of them. It's kind of like in Switzerland, you just call it cheese. <laughs> or a knife. No? Okay. Swiss Army? No? Anybody? Okay. So back in the day, which was a Tuesday, you would have just called it the church, and there were abuses going on. And so when you talk about the Protestant Reformation, you're talking about uh, leaders in different countries in Europe who were protesting those abuses. But if you talk about the Lutheran Reformation, just as the Lutheran Reformation, that's usually dated as pretty much Marty Luther's life. And then there's the people who pick up the Reformation after Luther dies, and they do different things with it. Everybody with me? Yep. So you're pretty much just dating that to Luther's life. That's why I've given you those dates, 1483 to 1546. Now, as we go through the study, and it's only four weeks long, are we going to exhaust everything you could have possibly said about the Reformation in four weeks? No. 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 People make their entire living off this time period in history. So we're not going to exhaust it, okay? Number one. Number two, uh, I am not a historical theologian. So as far outside of my comfort zone as I ever get, this is it. I'm stretching, okay? I'm stretching personally. So be easy on me because this is not my discipline. I'm a practical theologian. I'm from the practical department. That's where my doctorate is. I'm more worried about stuff like studying missions and stuff like that. Like I'm, I'm more that guy. This, this is as far as I get to stretch, okay? So that's why I'm giving you further resources. If you're super interested in this time period and or you're just super interested in history in general, I've given you two resources at the bottom of the slide. You may wanna take your phone or take a pen and jot down a note. Uh, the academic source, this would be like an academic textbook and it is written at that level, is the Protestant Reformation by Lewis Spitz, and it's published by CPH. So it's pretty easy for Lutherans to get a hold of it, okay? But that's an academic source. If you don't like reading academic writing, um, if you have trouble sleeping, I recommend <laughs> this volume, but it's, it's exhaustive. And it's, it's a really good just sort of uh, academic resource, as I said, for, for knowing what happened during those years. There's also an interactive website resource that I think is super cool, okay? 
It's just lutheranreformation.org, lutheranreformation.org. They have everything. They've got videos. They've got an interactive timeline of what happened when and what's the point. Super cool resource, visually very attractive, easy to use. So if you are more into that kind of a resource, great place to go is lutheranreformation.org. So you're not just tied to whatever we discuss in here for four weeks. Everybody with me? Yeah. Cool. So we got to talk about the guy, <coughs> Marty. <laughs> uh, who was Martin Luther? Uh, anybody want to take a stab at it? He was a Catholic monk. Yep. Anybody know, just out of pure curiosity, which order he belonged to? Like there's the Benedictine order, there's the Franciscan order. He was Augustinian. He was from the Augustinian order. Does anyone know what that significance is? So like if you're Franciscan, you're really into Mary. Like you're really into Mary if you're Franciscan. If you're Benedictine, you've got some reservations about the whole pray to Mary thing. So it depends on which order you're in as to what your bent is. Does anyone know what the significance of the Augustinian order means? It includes from uh, St. Augustine, his philosophy, mm -hmm. and sort of his teachings. Right. So St. Saint, Saint Augustine, uh, or uh, some people pronounce it St. Augustine. Either way, we're going to take it because I don't want to argue about it in a town in Florida, St. Augustine. So, um, yeah, so St. Augustine, he had, he had some rules, and those got passed down and became the, the basis for the Augustinian order. Uh, how about this? The Augustinian order was known as the strictest order, very austere and very strict. Perfect for a German. Set our rules and procedures. Okay. So uh, Luther, uh, the kind of bent he was, Okay, if you want to talk about a psych profile, he really enjoyed being a member of the Augustinian order with rules and procedures, okay? And it was very, very strict, okay? So Luther started out extremely strict. Uh, he would spend hours at a time confessing his sins to his father confessor. So we're not talking like go to the Catholic confessional, get in there and be like, forgive me, Father, for I've sinned. I went to a party on Friday, you know? Right? We're not talking that. We're talking hours. And at one point, his father confessor sent him back to his chambers because he's like, I've been listening to you for like two hours. You have not confessed anything remotely interesting. <laughs> I am bored. Go home. Right? Go back to your quarters. I don't want to talk to you any longer. Uh, but he was very serious about his religion and he was very serious about the rules of the order and he was very serious about his sinfulness. Um, the Augustinian order taught him to take his sinfulness as a sinful human being extremely seriously, and he did, okay? It also meant that he walked around feeling guilty all the time, um, which became a problem for him and then for everybody else. <laughs> he said, I'm going to make my problems your problem. Um, did Martin Luther originally start out to become an Augustinian monk? Does anybody know? No. What was he originally studying to be? A lawyer. A lawyer, which again tells you something about like rules and procedures, right? <laughs> rules and procedures. He started out uh, to become a lawyer. Uh, his dad was, I think, in the mining industry, and they pulled the money, like saved it up to send him to law school. Um, so here's how the university system worked at the time. You study at university, but a lot of people didn't graduate with a degree because what you would do is basically just study until the money ran out. And then you'd go into the workforce and say, I had this many years that I was able to study this particular subject. And you could still get hired based on that. And they'd say, oh, great. You know, well, you had three years. That's, I mean, that's a lot, you know, kind of a deal. 
Um, the fact that you didn't have a degree didn't always bother people like it would bother people today because that's how everybody did it. You studied until the money ran out and then you went into the workforce. So the fact that uh, Luther's parents uh, saved up enough money to send him to law school and then he changes to go into the Augustinian order, um, that was a point of contention, right? And then the fact that he was able through the church, because then they were paying for it to study for his doctorate was a big deal. So the fact that this guy was able to complete his degrees and not stop anywhere meant that people saw the potential in him and they invested in that potential. It would be what today we call a scholarship, except it came from either the church or private individuals. So he was patronized um, like you'd patronize an artist like you like so. Mozart had people bankrolling his compositions, right? Um, same kind of deal, except with scholarship, okay? Um, Luther is famous for the 95 Theses. Uh, hopefully you know about that. He nailed a bunch of 95 Theses to a church door in, in Wittenberg. Was Wittenberg a happening place? He was a professor on the faculty there. Was that that university, that town, is that a happening place? Uh, no, that's why I'm asking. Because we think of Wittenberg as like, oh, all this great scholarship is a happening place. It became a happening place as soon as people figured out what kind of minds were there on the faculty. Wittenberg is a backwater. So, uh, you, you mentioned, uh, Steve, St. Augustine. Many people think that guy must have had it going on. Um, he was from Hippo in North Africa, and at the time that was a breadbasket, but it was thought of culturally as backwater. So it was like being from, uh, frankly, Iowa or Nebraska. You grew a lot of corn there for everybody else, but nobody was thinking it was happening like New York City or someplace like that, right? Wow. It was considered flyover country. So sometimes, sometimes these, these great minds, they, they are from places that we don't think of them from as being from. Like we think of the, like if they're great minds, we think they have to be from the equivalent of New York City, right? But oftentimes they're not. They're from somewhere else where frankly, nothing's distracting you from thinking all day, you know? <laughs> And so uh, sometimes these great minds come out of these places that are a little surprising. And for these kinds of minds to come out of the faculty at Wittenberg, uh, were, that was really surprising to a lot of people. This was not the happening place, okay? It became the happening place because of who ended up on the same faculty, okay, in a university. So he, he nails 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg. Was that for everybody? Everybody, as we say down south, no. Who was that for? Uh, scholars. It was supposed to be a university debate, and it got way out of hand really fast. It was supposed to be a closed university debate. Well, if it's supposed to be a closed university debate, why does he post it on the church door? That was there. Y'all ever been to like a, I don't even know if they do this anymore, because I haven't seen a whole lot of these at like say Concordia, because everybody does everything electronically. You remember back in the end of the 20th century, for those of us who are ancient, you remember back in the mid to the late 20th century when we had built like big, like uh, bulletin boards in university dorm rooms and stuff or in the colleges, and people would post things on the board. Like this is a lecture coming up or here's a guest speaker coming or do you want to learn how to play guitar and impress the ladies, pull the little tabby? You know what I mean? You remember that? Uh, the church door was the bulletin board. It's just where you posted stuff. So it wasn't supposed to be for public consumption. It was supposed to be just a notice for academic debate in a closed academic debate between university professors. The reason it got out is because the world's first internet had recently been developed. It was Steve, not Steve Gutenberg. <laughs> no, that was the actor, sorry. It was Gutenberg, but not Steve Gutenberg, that's the actor. It was Gutenberg's printing press, okay? The printing press had just been invented, and so somebody got a hold of this thing and just started cranking out copies 
And in our modern parlance, it went viral in a hurry. Six okay. Copies an hour. Huh? Six copies an hour. Six copies an hour. Wow, we are breaking the, 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 the sound barrier there. Yeah. Six copies an hour. That's crazy fast. But it was. That's the weird thing. So when I get to this question here, uh, why Germany and why then? Part of the reason is because this German dude named Gutenberg came up with a new invention in called the printing press. And if you want to think of it, it had the same disruptive effect as the internet has had in this generation. Hugely disruptive effect. The fact that it was invented in Germany and then this, somebody got a hold of it. Luther didn't want it printed, like he didn't want it printed. He put it on a bulletin board to post for an academic debate. Somebody grabbed it and just started cranking out copies because it had great one-liners in it. Like, if the Pope could enter, could empty purgatory, uh, why wouldn't he do so out of love instead of for money? Yeah. Like, it's got great one-liners in it. So what they did was they took it and it just went viral in a hurry and everybody had read this thing, okay? Was Luther, though, here's a question for you. Was Luther the first to see growing problems in the Roman Catholic Church? No. Not by a long shot. Not by a long shot. There were Italian cats who had problems with the Roman Catholic Church. Um, there was this Bohemian, so today's Czech Republic, who had problems with the Catholic Church. Um, the Italian cat, uh, he survived, uh, but the, the Czech cat, they burned him. Tell you what we do to you guys like you who are troublemakers, we'll just burn you at the stake, you know. So when I get to why Germany and why they well, why Germany, they came up with this cool new thing called the printing press, which would be like saying we came up with this cool new idea called the internet. Hugely disruptive technology. Um, and why Germany, why then? It's because uh, Luther was the right guy at the right time in the right place with the right protectors. So Prince Frederick was a prince of the Holy Roman Empire. He's a German prince. And he had this big, really stout castle called the Wartburg. And he could protect Luther and keep the Roman Catholic Church from burning him like they had done other people who questioned the church. So it's not that Luther's the first. It's just that Luther's the first one to kind of get away with it. Not kind of, to get away with it. Like he survived and kept preaching and teaching and writing and they couldn't stop it. So that's why Germany, that's why now, that's why Luther. So then this is an important one. Did Luther act alone? He's the rock star of the period, but did he act alone? No, there are other guys, uh, principally guys like Philip Melanchthon, which is a funky name. And he ended up pinning, like if you ever read the Book of Concord or you've seen one, <laughs> Yeah. A lot of people don't read it. They're, they're like, I'm not going to read it, but I have it on the shelf. Um, yeah. A lot, yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, if you've ever seen the, the, the Reformation documents, they're compiled in what's called the Book of Concord. We don't have a separate set of scriptures or scriptures that we wrote, like the Book of Mormon that we put alongside the Bible. We're not like Mormons. The Book of Concord is just a grouping of Reformation documents that give you the history of what we were trying to teach and say about the scriptures. That's all that it is, okay? Which is why so many of us, frankly, have never read it, because we don't treat it like the Book of Mormon. It's not like a Bible. It's just a collection of historical documents. I like them, but I'm a nerd, so that's fine, okay? Um, but if you were to ever look at these documents, many of those documents, uh, I think a lot of Lutherans just picking up like the Book of Concord, they would probably assume that Luther wrote most of that. He didn't. Philip Melanchthon wrote most of that. But he didn't look real good on a postage stamp. You know what I mean? Like the, there are reasons why Luther is the rock star. First of all, he nailed the 95 Theses to the church door. Second of all, he was kind of this firebrand preacher and he had a way with words, right? Um, and he really, I mean, 
Luther would not be well thought of by Lutherans today. I'm just going to tell you that right now because he wasn't nice and he didn't play nice and he said things for uh, shock value. He said things for shock value. Um, if some of you have seen, it's now an older film. There was a film that came back out a decade or so ago where one of the Fines brothers played Martin Luther. And uh, there was this part where they said that he had called one of the cardinals an ass playing a harp. And they did not mean a donkey. <laughs> okay. Um, and that's true. Like quotes like that from the film are actually accurate. Um, he did say things like that and he did write things like that. And so he becomes the rock star in part because love him or hate him, Marty Luther got your attention. Okay. But he's not one of the like, okay, here's a nice guy of the Protestant Reformation, John Calvin. I mean, the guy said pious things in a pious way, right? Luther said pious things in a very raunchy way, okay? Um, but Calvin is thinking in French, and Luther's thinking in Deutsch, you know? So it's a different culture, and it's a different way of coming at it. But Luther would make many contemporary Lutherans today very uncomfortable. I don't think he'd be welcome in a lot of Lutheran churches because we would be put off by his style, okay? Um, but he did not act alone. There were a lot of people working together and not just in the church, but also in politics. So there were uh, like guys like Prince Frederick, but others, uh, politicians in the Holy Roman Empire who protected the movement so that it can continue. They didn't put, here's the, here's the weird thing to me about the Reformation. I've never, actually heard a historical theologian talk about this, and I'd like to hear somebody like a Will Schumacher or somebody speak to this, um, but I've never heard them come out and talk about how weird it was that in the years of the Lutheran Reformation, politicians protected the movement without getting in the middle of the movement. And usually politicians protect a movement that they think they can leverage, so that means they stick their fingers into it somewhere. What's weird about this movement is that the politicians protected the movement, but then let the academics and theologians argue about it. They didn't get in the middle of it and try to change it. Even if you look at the rest of the history of Christianity, you look at something like Constantine, Emperor Constantine, who made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. That's a guy who he, his mother, like the family literally got involved in what Christianity was going to look like moving forward. And that's kind of a typical response from politicians. What's weird about the Reformation is that the politicians protected it, but again, did not stick their fingers into the middle of it. They let the pastors hash it out, and they just protected it. It's odd, but it's also why the movement was really theological rather than political, even though it affected the political realm. And that's not common. It's pretty rare. So what's at issue in the Reformation? Uh, there's all kinds of ways that we could go at this study for the next four weeks, okay? Like all kinds of ways. And there's, this is not an exhaustive list of what's at issue. Because, um, how to say this? These people 500 years ago did not see religion the way Americans see religion. They didn't have a separation of church and state. It's all kind of one thing. And they didn't look at like politics as politics then and then like religion as just religion. Religion is going to affect politics, right? Um, they didn't look at family life as separate from religion. Religion affects your family life. Like they saw it as all through the lens of the fact that we're Christians. Okay. So that means that if we ask what's at stake in the Lutheran Reformation, 
There's all kinds of ways you can go at it. We got four weeks. So here's where I'm going. We're going to talk about indulgences because that has to do with the 95 theses that was nailed to the church door. Because those theses were supposed to be points to debate over the sale of indulgences to get people out of purgatory. So they were selling salvation. Has anybody been to the Vatican? Have you been to St. Peter's Basilica? One person. Okay. Uh, were you aware that that church was largely built with money from the sale of indulgences? Okay, there you go. Good Lutheran yeah, good Lutheran education. <laughs> what a beautiful building. It was, it, was, it was built with people trying to buy their way out of hell. Uh, good, good, good. Selling salvation. Builds big churches. Um, so we'll talk about indulgences uh, because that has to do with the 95 theses, and then we're going to talk about uh, the the, Refor the Lutheran Reformation is famous for the, the so-called five solas, and this comes from Latin, so sola grati, sola fide, sola scriptura, so in Latin, they would have debated these things in Latin to get over the, the hump of the language barrier between different academics and different colleges, they would have just debated everything in Latin, that way it's a common language. And so the solas come from these solas, and it, each sola just means alone, like by itself, right? There were five in the Reformation that became popular. So grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone, Christ alone. I'm blanking. What's the fifth one? Oh, yeah, all to the, yeah, only to the glory of God, right? So the five solas of the Reformation. Thank you. Mrs. Smith, give it up for our faculty over here, for our school faculty, way to go. So those are the five solas. I'm only going to focus on three. Why three? A, we only have four weeks. <laughs> B, these are still the ones that are, that are most commonly debated. So people won't typically debate Christ alone or to the glory of God alone. What they'll debate even between, like, say, Catholics and Lutherans today, they'll debate things like grace alone or faith alone, okay? Or even scripture alone, by the way. We'll talk about why that's still a debate, okay? So I've picked those three because those are still the ones that are up for grabs 500 years later. The good news is we no longer kill each other when debating these things because if you didn't know it, the Reformation kicked off years and years and years and generations of warfare in Europe over religion, okay? So wars like the Thirty Years' War, it, it kicked off these holy wars uh, where Catholics tried to take back Protestant territories by force. A lot of people died, um, which not to get all militant on everybody, but when you don't come to your Lutheran church or read your Bible or your catechism, it irks me because a lot of people died so that you could. We, as Americans, we talk about a lot of good men died for your freedom. We don't often as Lutherans talk about a lot of good men died so you could read that Bible, but it's the truth. A lot of people died so that you could uh, worship and so that you could read a Bible in your own language. And so that you could read it for yourself. And I can preach on it, but we could argue over it. Whereas before, you can't interpret it for yourself. And I'll just tell you what it says, and you can't argue with me. So a lot of freedom of conscience, a lot of freedom of religion, all that stuff that we hold so dear, that has nothing to do with the U.S. Constitution. That has to do with the Lutheran Reformation. Okay, the seeds of it, the roots of it are in the Reformation. And so um, we'll, we'll talk about these things. We'll talk about the, the sale of indulgences, what was going on there. We'll talk about grace alone, faith alone, and scripture alone. Uh, when it comes to the sale of indulgences, uh, here's what you have to get. Catholics still believe in purgatory today. So it's not heaven, it's not hell. It's a place where you go and have like your impurities kind of burned off. Uh, through a process of purification before you go to heaven. And it can take however long it takes. Uh, in the Catholic imagination, it can take 500 years. It can take 1,000 years. It can take whenever. 
uh, to perfect you before you're allowed to, to go into heaven. But the idea is that you would you would be perfected, not that the blood of Christ covers you, therefore you are declared innocent, but that you are perfected, you are perfect, and therefore you enter into heaven. Where do they get the teaching of purgatory? Good, I'm glad you asked. They got it from a bunch of books that are not in your Bible as a Protestant. They got it from the Apocrypha, the Apocryphal works. Um, and there's like one reference in there. And from that one reference, they built this whole theology of purgatory, okay? Not the strongest argument ever, but they had built this whole system up where there was this place called purgatory. Uh, Catholics, do they still sell indulgences to get you time out of purgatory? Yes, actually they still do, believe it or not. This many years later and after all of this baloney that went on between everybody and all the debates and all the wars and everything, I would have thought that it would have stopped. They did not. They still sell indulgences, okay? And it's time out of purgatory. They only do it for big holy days and special occasions and whatever else, but they still, they actually do still, still sell them. Um, and so the idea is uh, you buy this indulgence uh, from the Pope and you get X number of years out of purgatory. They were using this money to pay back loans that they had got from largely Jewish bankers. So you want to talk about the roots of anti-Semitism in Europe. They had gotten uh, this, they, they used money from uh, Jewish bankers, largely Jewish bankers. Why do they have to use Jewish bankers? They're the only ones available that have the money. Uh, well, there's a reason they have the money. What can you, what does the Bible say you can't do? Charge what? Interest. Interest. Bible says you can't charge interest. That's the same Bible the Jews are reading, but by this point in history, they had done away with that, and they were charging interest. Okay, It's called usury. The old word is usury. Christians at this time still hadn't gotten over the whole, the Bible says don't charge interest thing, and so they were not charging interest. Well, your economy can only grow at a certain rate if you're not charging interest. So the big bankers were actually Jewish folks. It's kind of like today in the Middle East, you can buy a bottle of wine, but you will not buy it off of a Muslim. The guy that owns the liquor store is a Christian. Because okay, if the Christian owns a liquor store, he's a sinner and going to hell anyway, right? So that's how Christians treated Jews. They're a bunch of sinners going to hell anyway because they, they killed Jesus, you know? So if you want to talk about the roots of anti-Semitism in Europe, Part of it has to do with the banking industry and the fact that they were the first to the door because they didn't have a hang up like Christians had a hang up religiously, even though they're reading the same Bible. So they were borrowing money from Jewish bankers in order to build these big cathedrals and stuff. And then they have to pay back the money. Where do you get the money? Um, well, because the state and the church were kind of in cahoots um, at this time in Europe, a lot of people, like a lot of people today, didn't put a whole lot in the offering plate. So that means that if you don't have the mentality that Americans do, that if we don't support our own ministry, it will go under. There's less motivation to put something in the offering plate anyway. Purgatory came, became useful, and indulgences became useful because you could sell people indulgences to give them time out of purgatory. Then you could collect all that money and use it to pay back the bank. That's really all this was about, period. And Martin Luther, uh, late in his ministry career, wrote how sorry he was that he was so young and stupid at the very beginning because he saw the abuse of the sale of indulgences, selling salvation to build churches. And he saw the abuse going on. And the first person he wrote about it was his local bishop. So it would be like if I saw abuses going on in the Nebraska district and the first person I wrote about it was Rich Snow because I thought, Rich Snow is the district president. He will care. Luther did not know how the sausage was made. And he did not get that his local bishop was in on the scam. 
So he wrote to his ecclesiastical superior, thinking his ecclesiastical superior would care about the consciences of faithful Christians. But all the bishop cared about was the money, the flow of money that pays off the churches. Not that I'm accusing Rich Snow of doing that, by the way. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying that's the example that I would give you. It would be like if I wrote Rich and Rich wrote back and said, I've already said that this was okay. Leave it alone. And then he didn't leave it alone. And later in his ministry career, he actually wrote how sorry he was that he didn't understand how politics in the church works, that he was so stupid and naive as to believe that a bishop would care, that he didn't understand that the bishop is probably in on it. So uh, when he penned the 95 Theses, A, he meant it to be an academic debate, closed door academic debate between faculty members. B, he did not understand that a lot of his higher ups, his ecclesiastical superiors, were in on the scam. He thought it was a mistake, and that if he simply brought their attention to it, they would correct the error. Marty really loved Jesus and really didn't get it. He was a really smart man who at the beginning could not tie his own shoes because he actually thought people would care about the thing they were supposed to say that they cared about. This whole Protestant Reformation started out because this guy thought, if I just bring this these abuses to the attention of the people who are above me in the structure of the church, they will see we've all made a mistake and we will correct the mistake because we all love Jesus. He did not mean to get kicked out of the Catholic church. He did not mean for wars to start over this. He did not mean for all the social upheaval, not at the beginning. He literally thought he was helping. And I think that that's an important thing to note because there are different other Protestant reformations that get kicked off in other countries for very vastly different reasons. So the Protestant Reformation in England got kicked off because an English king needed a divorce. Right? That's a vastly different reason for starting like a, 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 a protest movement against Rome. The fact that Luther's Reformation started out over a theological error and that he really thought he was helping is, a, is something that is, it's something that we need to keep in front of us all the time. This guy had pastoral concerns because he preached in a local parish with local people. So even though he was on a theological faculty at a university, He's not a guy who lives separate from the people. So the fact that he was a parish preacher preaching in a pulpit, along with lecturing the university students, meant that whether you talk about the ivory tower that we make fun of sometimes in higher ed, or you talk about just the level of the people and somebody's he's talking to a farmer or a machine worker, Luther got what all of these abuses were doing to everybody up and down the social strata. And his concern was pastoral, that people not be taught that they can buy their way into heaven, that people not be taught that they have to work their way into heaven, but that people be taught that Jesus Christ has died for a bunch of people who could never earn our way into heaven, and so, therefore, the Bible says that we are set free, we are forgiven because of the blood of Jesus and on no other account. His concern was very pastoral. And unfortunately, it kicked off a powder keg of a bunch of other issues. And it caused absolute chaos for a while. But to me, it matters why a Reformation movement starts. This didn't start because a powerful king needed a divorce. It started because a local pastor cared about his church members. 
Okay, I love you. Jesus loves you. I'll see you next week. <laughs>